things for those that require it. Um, you can share your comments in the comment section. And if you have a question, uh, we have a segment in our event to allow for question and answer time. My colleague will also put on the hashtags um, for this event uh, in the chat box. And please do uh, tag us or tweet at us and we'll do our best to connect with you during the event or even after the event. Um, I will introduce uh, the speakers uh, presenting today uh, as we get uh, into um, the panel part of um, in the discussion, but it'll be amazing if you can um, introduce yourselves in the chat box as well um, with a name and you know where you're joining us from. That'd be great for us to know. Um, who are we? Uh, the We Rise Coalition um, is a feminist partnership between seven diverse women's rights organizations in Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, and Australia. The coalition resources, the core work of each of the partner organization and partners work to secure the safety and leadership of um, diverse women and girls and engage in collective work to strengthen the Pacific feminist movement. So coming to the event that we are at today, we have called it Women of the Pacific, looking at policies to practical realities when it comes to the complex, but a reality for us, which is the climate crisis and what impacts it manifests for us as uh, the Pacific peoples. The global and regional geopolitical and development context is changing drastically in our Pacific continent or shall I say the blue Pacific continent and the challenges of ongoing vulnerabilities to environmental, climate change, disaster risk and economic shocks as well. In 2020, the COVID-19 global pandemic and the ongoing climate disasters have seen unprecedented impacts resulting in immediate and long-term health, economic and social challenges for women in our region. Climate change, or as we term it, crisis, is an ex ex existential threat to the Pacific way of life, and it will exacerbate other challenges already affecting the region. This panel will highlight not only the issues that you know, we are facing with the climate crisis, but also look into some examples of policies related to dealing with or coping with the climate crisis and disasters. So whilst the climate crisis is one that affects all, we usually don't see policies, legislation and programs being inclusive or gender responsive. Our panelists will delve into why that is the case and what can be done better. So I would like us to um, begin the panel because we have um, quite a bit to unpack. So I take you to, um, the wonderful um, land of where our first panelist, Lily Vassour is from. Uh, she, Lily is a women rights defender and an advocate for political, economic and social empowerment uh, for women uh, in her native country of Papua New Guinea. She hails from the Jiwaka province in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Lily is the founder and director for Voice for Change, which is a provincial NGO based and working in the Jiwaka province. Voice for Change focuses on ending violence against women and girls and building alliances with communities and provincial governments in Jiwaka to advocate for safer communities and to end all forms of violence. So Lily, my question to you is in the context of Papua New Guinea or more so in the context of where you work, what are the challenges you are facing and how are the women's rights organizations, including yours, um, you know, working to deal with those challenges? And do you see how policies, um, you know, and um, legislation that has been put in by our governments or even the regulations by our provincial governments how is that being done? Where are the women and girls when it comes to we're making um, these policies, these regulations work for all? Lily, welcome. Thank you and uh, hello everybody. Uh, good morning from Papua New Guinea. 
uh, I am able to share with you uh, the practical experiences of working with the rural uh, women in terms of um, the climate changes and the climate crisis. I think importantly, um, I would like to stress here is that uh, the women, most of the women, the rural people, they lack information. They don't really know what is really happening because most of them, they have been using the traditional calendar and they're confused with the long period of rain, they're confused with long droughts and so many things happening and there, there, there's a challenge of lack of information. I would like to share one particular uh, experiences that we worked with them. In 2020, we had a drought of for about three months. And when this drought occurs, we had a woman facing uh, a lot of uh, problem with water shortage. They have to travel to the nearby creek to get water. And during this process of moving, they have been uh, abused, they have been arrested, they have been uh, assaulted. They, some of them have been, uh, they've been charged to pay to collect water from where the, 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 the landowners of the river, uh, where the creek was or the river was flowing through. So these are the, uh, the challenges that the women have faced where we were able to go out and do document them. And so, and then the, the other one was the, the women, the challenge, one of the challenges that we face with the, especially the vulnerable women that most of these women that we support with, uh, they, they normally buy and sell. And from the, they do this retail in the, the middle woman that buys and sells from the farmer. And the extra money that they make that normally sustains her and her family. So they were not able to um, resell again because of, they were not able to resell again because of the lack of continuous production because of the effect on the diverse um, uh, climate. On, on them, so the women were not able to uh, continue this, this activity. So these were the, some of the challenges that we actually uh, documented cases and at consultation with the women there. Some of the approaches that we took, try to, to see how we can address this. One of the issue, one of them regarding the water, we were able to talk to one of the community and also talk to the leaders there. We also asked the police to see if we can help them uh, to come to a common understanding that water is needed by everybody and they have to access the water. So this was one of the strategies or one of the approach that we took to, we try to bring the people together to talk to them that they have to, um, they need water and they can let them pass that, uh, let them, allow them to uh, get water from the creek, from their creek, which runs on their land. Regarding the women who have been especially reselling, we have now worked to reduce, introduce them to, to micro savings so that they can save a little bit of money that they make so that when such times rises, they can be able to use this money to help meet the needs of the family. I think these are some of the practical approaches that, that we have been taking. The third one is we're trying to uh, inform people and getting out awareness that such things are gonna happen. And people are really confused because, you know, this is something that has never happened. The elderly people are saying that this is, they've never experienced such like that before, like the, the, the long drought. And also at times we have the flood, the flood like the river floods, which they never flooded before. So this is something that we, we need to make the people understand what is really happening. Thank you, Nalini. Thank you very much, uh, Lily, for uh, your uh, very insightful uh, contribution to this discussion. And I'm sure those that have joined us in this panel, this event, will have lots of questions. So please do type them up in uh, um, the chat uh, box and uh, we will um, do our best to have uh, all the panelists respond to them. But let me now take you to the wonderful country of Samoa where um, uh, you know, I'd like to introduce you to our next panelist, um, who is Doris Tulifau. And she is um, someone that has been very courageous and uh, she's begun a nonprofit organization called Brown Girl Woke. 
uh, in Samoa, um, you know, very recently. And it was the first ever organization to provide programs and, and conferences for Pacific Islanders who are living in, in, in California. Um, and uh, Doris has worked with uh, homeless shelters um, that have looked after, you know, many of the homeless from the Asia and the Pacific um, in California. And as a cultural correspondence for five years, she has encountered, um, you know, with Sa uh, Samoans and uh, Tongans in those shelters. Um, Doris has also volunteered and worked uh, in Samoa uh, and in a variety of organizations, including the Young um, Women Christian Association for Samoa, the Samoa Victim Support Group, Juniors, and the Samoa Cancer Society. So Sha Samoa um, is presenting a very interesting uh, case for us because um, um, you know they have recently elected um, a woman as their prime minister, and we are all very proud of the fact. But um, Doris is uh, would like to show a little short video. Um, to us all. So before we go into showing the video, Doris, we'd like to take a couple, uh, a minute or so to just explain what the video is about. And uh, then I will ask you the question that uh, we present to you. Hello everyone, my name is Malusel Doris Salifao. The video that we're about to watch is our Climate Change Club. Um, it's under 350, 350 Pacific is a known youth climate change advocacy around the world. Uh, and we have our club at the University of South Pacific, and we allow the students um, to tell the story as Pacific Islanders, our orators, through this video. A person's responsibility, a nation's obligation, the world's duty, climate change, a term so carelessly thrown around, yet its value so vital to the survival of our race. Our beautiful Pacifica, so deep in the clutches of this nightmare, they see our suffering, they hear our anguish, they know our fears, yet they brush it off so cavalier, they greed for wealth trumps any hope for our islands to remain. The desire to attain more pushes our homes to the brink of no return. How is it that we contribute the least to the world's carbon footprint, yet we carry the heaviest consequences? The same goes, the strong prey on the weak, and they see us as such. They think the sizes of our land determine the strength of our wills. Their injustice stirs the passion beneath the surface of every islander. The drive to see their homes last another generation. The pull to see the region at its primal beauty. The hope that these small islands will make a change. This hope pushes me to stand strong. It ignites a fire within me to see justice served. This is my message to anyone willing to listen. To my brothers and sisters of blood, and a bond. Answer my call. Take up arms and stand beside me. Bear with me. Fight with me. We are Pacifico. That was indeed a very powerful video. Thank you, Doris, for sharing that. And um, coming back to um, this panel, my question to you would be, you know, if you could share your perspectives around Samoa's commitments in terms of addressing the climate crisis, um, you know, what would be um, off focus for you? And um, if you can elaborate in terms of, well, you know, how have women been involved or left out in terms of um, the development of the policies and legislation? What issues are you, going to be focusing on for us, because I know there's been a lot being done, 
um, in uh, many of our countries in relation to adaptation and mitigation, um, you know, measures that uh, have been implemented. So Doris. Oh. Thank you. Um, like we, like you said, um, so beautifully, we elected our first woman prime minister and she spoke last year um, during COP26 about what we need for climate change. And like everyone is talking about climate change finance. And that's something that is huge for me and should be huge for all of us in the Pacific as we only contribute 0.03% to the climate crisis yet we are feeling most uh, the most uh, effects globally. So what can we do is to make sure that we're in these seats sitting um, in this conversation as women are the frontliners. We're always the people that are there, the local experts to know where this funding should be. But unfortunately with the climate um, change finance, it does go to bigger organizations that take care of this, like the Green Fund, and sometimes makes us feel that we don't have uh, the expertise <laughs> or the right to be there, but we do. Um, I want to quote what um, our prime minister said about um, what we should do with climate change finance, but also to a bigger understanding of what Samoa has been doing. Samoa is committed to reducing uh, greenhouse emissions from the electricity subsector through the adapt, adoption of 100% renewable energy to target 2025, which is a very huge <laughs> um, expectation as it built, they said this in 2017 and 2025 is just around the corner. I know we probably said this during the time but we did not know that we would have COVID, but they have done a lot of work trying to make sure that um, we have renewable electricity, which is huge. Um, with what I said earlier with the amazing woman prime minister Fiume on speaking last year, this is just a quote from what she said. We need to ensure and we need to ensure a new scale of climate finance goal that builds on the USD of hundred billion dollars on the floor. We must guarantee a balanced allocation of climate finance between mitigation and adaptation. Climate finance made available to SIDS are still insufficient and mainly in the form of loans. The prime minister calls to small island developing states to receive scaled up adequate, predictable and long-term support from the international community to, to adapt. With all this said, there's been hundred billion dollars going towards the, the climate um, change crisis. We're not seeing that money locally. We need to make this a local international women rights uh, and have us sitting um, in these conversations. What have has Brown Girl Woke has do, have done to help? We've we've um, started clubs at the schools. It feels sometimes it feels that we were not doing enough, but education is key, especially for this next generation, where we're letting we're giving this next generation the world that we've we so far, which is horrible right now. But they need to be educated. So, uh, with the amazing group from Three Fifty Pacific, we've made a subgroup at the University of South Pacific to educate the university students on what they need to know about climate change. With that, we go into the schools and primary schools to start clubs on uh, climate change and how to speak about it, also doing storytelling. I think what I've learned with the coalition that we're in right now, we rise, is that um, people like me <laughs> need to step aside from uh, youth advocacy and start making sure that I'm in these seats in my own country, um, learning more about what are the policies and how do we make sure that this funding um, goes to our local entities and what they are, what they need to speak out about. Sorry, I mean, I kept going and going. <laughs> which is in fact resonating in my opinion across the Pacific Island countries. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm sure there will be questions for you uh, later on. But let me take um, everyone uh, 
across the you know the Pacific to another country to back to Fiji um, and um, you know uh, bring us to um, the work that Femling Pacific uh, you know does here in Fiji and introduce you all to Susan Gray. Uh, Susan Gray has um, you know several years of experiences experience working directly uh, you know in electoral agencies in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, specifically supporting civil society. And she has extensive experience in you know, project management, policy, strategy development, et cetera. Um, she is the executive director for FemLink Pacific, which is a local, regional, and national catalyst for change through the use of accessible media and information technologies. Um, and uh, she says that FemLink Pacific seeks a Pacific region where there is uh, gender justice, ecological sustainability, peace, freedom, equality, and human rights. So welcome, Susan. And I believe you also have a little video um, to share um, before we uh, delve into the question that, that I have for you. So before we show the video, would you like to explain what we are going to be watching in um, a couple of sentences, Susan, welcome. Sure, Nalini, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Nalini, for that. And thank you all those that have zoomed in. Uh, the little video that, uh, that will be played basically just captures the voices of our diverse women's network in the northern part of Fiji, which is Vanua Levo, where I'm from. Uh, and those, um, and the voices basically um, they, they basically talk about the impact on their lived reality or really their stories about what happened um, after the uh, event of Cyclones Yasa and, Cyclone, yeah, uh, and Cyclones Anna. Uh, and that was late 2020 and early 2021 and the floods that occurred straight after. This year, so when it happened in the north, uh, individuals with disability had a very hard time to access the evacuation centers. The infrastructure for evacuation centers were not disability friendly. Not only that, uh, there were issues coming out from evacuation centers with regards to women being uh, victims of sexual abuses. And that's something that the National Disaster Management Office could look into. The sort of information that they give out for preparedness should not only be on preparing for disasters, but also on areas of respecting boundaries during natural disasters. One of the strongest cyclones uh, up there with Winston. Some people lost their homes, a lot of crops, the backyard gardening, and people had a lot of uh, damages done and lost a lot of properties and their crops. And most of the farms in Lombasa were totally destroyed. It was really hard for the farmers to get in their produce because fallen trees were lying down there across the road. Most of the vendors don't have anything to sell. This affects their income. A recommendation to the community, to the stakeholders and to the state of the government, if only we could have evacuation centers within the village to cater for our elderly people and the disability as they are unable to go to the schools which are mostly used as evacuation centers. TCS has affected my life personally with uh, the life of uh, those that live in the same community as I do. The damage is done to the property and the amount of money that we had to used in order to restore what we had lost during TCSA. With food security, water and electricity, also with uh, the education of children. And, uh, during this uh, pandemic, the women and children, they suffered a lot. 
and when the pandemic came, uh, they were not prepared for it. And also they didn't have all the knowledge of uh, how to go about it. And they were, had fear, a lot of fear, because there were a lot of uh, deaths going on. I agree with the statement that women and children face the worsened <coughs> impacts of disasters, including the pandemic, because most of the women have to be resilient, get up and uh, find ways to cater for their families. My recommendation to the community that uh, they have to have some savings before any disaster strikes. They have to have uh, preventative measures with them and for the government to give assistance to both farmers and vendors as well during any disaster. Thank you very much, um, Susan, for um, that, that video, which um, really had highlights and spotlight, spotlights on the issues that we face um, here in PG, uh, where we have seen um, the frequency of tropical cyclones increasing. And you know we're not able to recover from one, and we get hit with another one. So my question to you would be in regards to sharing uh, in terms of the work that Family Pacific has been doing. I mean, you have been connecting um, the national, the local to national, regional uh, and global in terms of the available spaces um, you know, to talk about um, the impact of uh, disasters and climate change um, as it relates to how it impacts women. But, you know, um, in reflecting on that, would you also I uh, would like to, you know, share your focus in terms of which particular area uh, for policy or programs in PG, or do you think, um, you know, um, it serves women and, you know, or, or has not, and how have we been involved in that, or, you know, is, is that an existing gap? Thank you, Nalini, for that. And, um, you know, I'm actually zooming in right now from Baha, which is in the Western, uh, which is a Western town of Fiji. And uh, I'm actually here for World Met Day. And, you know, we have the ministers for disaster responsible for the NDMO, responsible for Fiji Met uh, here in this particular uh, location. Um, and the theme of that is, you know, uh, early warning and early action. And Family Pacific has been invited to be part of the space. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, and this is all part of what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, is take those voices to the national. And here we are also trying to take those voices to the global. Um, so, uh, so with Family Pacific, Nalini, you know, I mean, central to our work is our feminist work is a women's weather watch modality that we've taken to, you know, even parts of the Pacific. Um, and I'd like to focus specifically on, you know, the disasters, the climate crisis. You've heard about the women when they're talking about the pandemic. So we're talking also about a multiple crisis and the impacts on the lived realities or, you know, or, or basically on how it's impacting diverse rural women and girls. So recently we conducted uh, in the northern part of Fiji over the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And those were the voices that you just heard. And that was around about October last year. Uh, so we we had uh, you know we Viti Levu was on lockdown, so it was our young feminist media team there in Banu Levu that conducted about five intergenerational dialogues in all the three provinces, and those dialogues basically was really about you know um, the experiences of tropical cyclone Yasa, which made which made landfall in Banu Levu. And, um, and so on, and a northern feminist community radio station really also felt the brunt of the cyclone, just like much of the infrastructure on the island. Uh, a month later, around about January, a few of us also, you know, traveled up to the north. There was also a lower level cyclone, TCASA, that also made landfall, that cut through Viti Levu, but brought heaps of moisture and so much rain that caused widespread flooding in the north. So. Um, you know, so what we tried to do as a feminist media organization was do that media documentation of the stories of the women in a safe space. And why we do it, you know, that's the modality and the methodology that we use. We do that because we know it is us that they can talk to, 
And, and that basically stories, storytelling, the Talano, that that is really the data of the Pacific Islands and so on. So, you know, we do that storytelling, we do those convenings, those rural, diverse rural convenings with a feminist media approach of do no harm, where we try and also allow that unfiltered and that authentic voice to emerge and so forth. Um, in a village in the north, uh, the women basically spoke about the heating of the sea and their personal security. There was there also, you know, they had the assigned traditional role where they were to bring in the reef fish and the crabs. However, the sea became hotter than usual, even in the dark. They wore long sleeve garments, were fend off the mosquitoes out in the sea. And because it was dark and the seas would be cooler as the night wore on, they went in groups for their own personal security, conscious of not being alone. So we've tried to share that with state agencies. Their voices, their findings is imperative for our work. So with that, you know, we try and seek gender justice and encourage women's particip participation and leadership in disaster preparedness, response and, re and recovery. And, and that is exactly why I'm here, you know, here in um, Ba and Nalini, you know, to also meet up with Director NDMO, Director Matt and, and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, so, you know, I'm, you know, we, we really, you know, would like to also just also talk, talk about the statistics that we have got with the impacts of cyclones Yasa and Anna. They were top, the top four responses that we saw in that assessment that the women were basically talking about their personal safety, which was around about 71%, their mental health, and also their ability to see families and friends. And that's where their mental health also came about. And you talk about the policies to practicalities. With that, the questions of practicalities do emerge. Fiji has a national disaster risk reduction policy for 2018 to 2030. That policy has guiding principles covering human rights and gender-based approaches. Do we in the movement, in the women's movement, really, really know about that? How about that engagement? And does that policy really reflect the real, the lived realities of diverse women and girls? We just did an assessment just late last year. And these are the same old issues that are appearing about evacuation centers. This policy was put into place in 2018. And with that, Nalini, I will now, um, I know that there's, uh, you know, the, the time is up for me, but, you know, I'm happy to also answer questions. Thank you so much, Susan. Incredible work indeed. And yes, um, you've um, highlighted what we have been saying, that um, we don't think that women are um, not let alone in the spaces where such consultations and decisions are being made. Um, and our concerns are not therefore uh, heard when policies and regulations and legislation uh, are being crafted and enforced. We'll come back to that in a little while, um, but let me take all of us. And we were supposed to also go to Tonga. However, um, our partner from Tonga um, is unable to join us. And I'm sure uh, everyone that is part of this um, uh, event will know that Tonga recently faced an incredible amount of hardship with um, you know, the volcanic eruption that, that happened um, and uh, the uh, tsunamis that came in uh, in the aftermath. So uh, they are unable to um, join us today, but I'm sure um, if our partner, uh, which is the Talitha project uh, from Tonga, if they were um, with us, they would share um, the same sentiments um, around how um, you know, these policies and regulations in terms of addressing the impacts of climate change and disasters, um, you know, really don't have um, us on the table um, and our voices missing from them. So how do they respond to our needs? Well, that's the big question. But so now I have the pleasure of taking you to um, Vanuatu, where we have um, a partner organization, Sister. Uh, led by an incredible young woman, uh, Yasmin, um, uh, who is an activist for women's rights and empowerment. Uh, she is the executive director and founder of SISTA, which is a charitable organization based in Vanuatu and driven by feminist values. SISTA aims to use arts, media, and communication to empower women and girls and raise awareness and advocate on issues that affect them. They were also recently established um, in 2016, in fact, 
And uh, since that time, sister has evolved um, uh, during, you know, where women across the globe have been standing in solidarity with each other to challenge oppression and claim their rights. Um, their vision is simple, so she says, but we know that it's um, one that we share with and it's incredibly difficult uh, at times, but their vision says that we want to live in a world where women and girls are able to enjoy their rights and participate fully in decisions that affect their lives. So it's exactly on that tone that um, I welcome Yasmin um, as our next panelist. Um, and I ask her to share, you know, what has been happening in Vanuatu, because, um, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, Vanuatu is, um, you know, having an outbreak of COVID-19, um, a slightly delayed, but, you know, there have been significant um, number of cases, um, as well as Vanuatu has been very proactive in the Pacific in relation to coming up with uh, a number of policies and regulations in response to adapting and mitigating to the impacts of climate change. So Yasmin, over to you. Um, hello everyone and thank you so much Nalini. It's um, wonderful to be here with everybody. Um, so I would like to start off by talking a little bit about our current situation in Vanuatu. So since the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, Yasmin, um, if you can put up your camera, please. We would like to see you. Okay. Like of the pandemic, Vanuatu has closed its borders and has only been accepting rep repatriation flights. We've managed to keep ourselves safe for the past two years, up until March 4th of this year, where we had our first community outbreak. Um, patient zero had no travel history and was identified to be a member of parliament who allegedly breached a quarantine facility to visit friends. This case is currently under investigation and has brought to light an issue that Vanuatu has tolerated since the beginning of our independence in 1980, that there is one rule for the big man and one rule for everyone else. I apologize. So Vanuatu's governance is based on a Westminster system with Melanesian values and Christian pr principles. Our parliament members are only men and we've only had a handful of women represented in the national, in our um, the highest decision-making body of our country. The last one being a decade ago, decade ago of having women in our decision-making body. So I'm telling you all of this because I want to talk about how um, whoever is in um, about uh, the whole landscape to be able to emphasize the importance of having women in these spaces to manage the climate crisis. Many of our 52 MPs have chiefly ranks with kinship and language tying across political groups, ensuring communi community participation and social protection. While this can be positive, it also enables an environment where constitu constituencies are afraid to speak out and we do not question our politicians' actions out of respect. We have witnessed corruption, stealing, and endured convicted criminals as our MPs. But this incident of having a member of parliament go into a quarantine facility, breaching it, not cooperating with health officials, has helped us to understand as a people that we must take a stand against this behavior and have zero tolerance, as this particular incident put all of our lives at risk. Thankfully, we've had no fatal fatalities, and only two people are hospitalized to date, um, with 1,117 cases confirmed since the beginning of 2022. I bring this up to start our conversation to highlight one of the biggest barriers to address the climate crisis. There must be political will to address the climate crisis. And at this point, I'm not sure if we have that in Vanuatu. Last year, our prime minister announced that we would be setting up a ministry of oceans, fisheries and maritime affairs. He stated that the purpose of this new ministry is to increase revenue to the government through fishing. There has been no other pub public documents or reasons to justify setting up this ministry, which has come at the expense of dismantling the Ministry of Justice and Community Services. I'd like to give the benefit of the doubt 
that perhaps a Ministry of Oceans is very much needed for other reasons besides the government needing revenue um, through fishing, because right now our biggest revenue um, stream is through passport sales. So maybe we need to diversify. Um, but um, uh, I'm really not sure if this is really the intention. You know, maybe we need a ministry given the current fate of our world's lar largest ecosystem, our ocean, which has seen major fishing corporations um, exploiting our waters while oil and gas companies mine our sea floors for more unbur unburnable carbon. And perhaps Vanuatu is taking a stance to ensure we are part of the global decision-making given that an extensive and evolving body of international law governs our oceans. And who knows, maybe we could potentially be advocates to protect marine ecosystems Systems and promote sustainable marine industries, but I'm not sure if that's really our intention. The fact that we dismantled the Ministry of Justice, which is responsible for overseeing our human rights and a number of key agencies, including the Department of Women's Affairs, the Child's Desk, the Disability Desk, Correctional Services and Courts, to set up a Ministry of Oceans is concerning, particularly given the fact that it was done without due process. At the time when this was happening, the Director General of the Ministry of Justice, Madame Doris Day Kenneth, which is one of Vanuatu's longest serving senior female public servants, questioned the government for not following this due process and was terminated. There was no consultations and no strategy provided. She recently won her, co her court case and the Council of Ministers revoked its decision to establish a Ministry of Oceans and instructed the Prime Minister's office to resubmit the paper following provisions of the Government Act. But the example has already been sent. Do not question the government or you will be silenced. Doris Day Kenneth is no longer a public servant and she was a key person to speak out on women's issues and ensure our voices were heard. She held more senior positions in government than any other woman in our country's history. And this is a huge loss. Um, so basically for me, if we wanna address the climate crisis, we need to challenge the entire political system, which is rooted in patriarchy. We cannot dilute the voices of women. We cannot exclude women in decision-making. We cannot silence women when they speak out. And we are in this climate crisis because we have been exploiting the earth to produce and consume in an unsustainable way. This isn't just about carbon emissions. It's about how we take resources, lands and rights of others in the process. This process is systemic and politicized and those who contribute the least to the crisis are the most affected. We are up against giants, big corporations and patriarchal governments, but we are living in a time where women are committed to stand together and shape decisions and influence policy to protect Earth the way she has protected us and given us this home, especially for us in the Pacific, we really are living in such a wonderful abundant land. Um, you know, I can see that even now with COVID, gosh, it doesn't matter if we're on lockdown, we all have backyard gardens, it's all good. Um, so we do have a duty to do it. The time is now to create a world that has space for everyone. And it starts with including women in important decision-making spaces to drive innovative solutions and justice for all and to protect our, our environment for the benefit of all living beings in the future to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for making so much sense. And I absolutely resonate with your calls as well. Um, let me uh, have a look at the chat box where I see there's been a lot of uh, conversation and I can see that there are some questions. So I will attempt to take some of those and um, get our panelists to respond. Um, so Chris Knight from Sir Optimus. Um, You've been prolific with your questions, so I will pick a few and pose them to the panelists. The first one uh, question is to Lily. Lily, if you can uh, turn your camera on and, and uh, uh, come on to um, the screen. There's a question for you. Uh, Chris Knight is asking uh, that PNG is to have an elections uh, soon, this year, in fact. Uh, he's asking whether the women in your area are enrolled and able to vote, and what can he, uh, he's from the sort of optimist um, international, but there are clubs in Papua New Guinea, um, you know, what can they do to assist you? And um, so, yes, Lily, what uh, would you like to say? Thank you. Yes, 
we are preparing for the election now and we are really doubtful of what the election will turn out, but everybody's uh, working really hard to have a, a violent free and a successful election this year. Uh, regarding the women last week, the UNDP has, um, has run a, a session on the uh, mock parliamentary uh, practice session and there were about 65 women were enrolled and they had this, uh, this session. So by the 28th of this next month, April, we should know. Uh, that's when the reach will open and then the nominations will begin. And by mid-April, we would know how many women are actually contesting for the, for the national uh, election that is coming this, this week. Uh, yesterday, we had a briefing from one of our senior police uh, from the nearby district that there are firearms, a lot of firearms being moved within our, within our area. And she was uh, pleading to us to need to collaborate to see that we have a violent free and a safe election and everybody exercise their rights to vote. Uh, so there will be um, an area where a lot of uh, campaign and awareness needs to be done. One of the things that uh, potential thing came out of this, uh, a lot of reviews has been done after the national elections is now they're saying that there will be uh, separate pulling boots for the women. I think in the next, next last election, there were some done in, in some other provinces in the nation, in, but now this year said that there'll be uh, separate pulling boots uh, for the women to do to vote separately. So we hope that this will give the women the, the, um, the, the rights to exercise their rights to choose the, who the leader they want. So we are hoping that this will happen. On the other hand, we are, um, we are very mindful because of this uh, information that we got from the police yesterday, um, but so many um, um, harms are being moved in. So yes, we, we will be needing uh, help and support and prayers uh, as we go to the pooling and we don't really know, uh, as for the organization like Waste for Change on the ground, we are now will be calling in for the risk and safety. How we can we can you know intervene where there is a need, and how can we help if we are able to help? You know, but this is what we are preparing for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily, and um, I hope um, for a change um, that we have uh, many women candidates um, who are also standing, and this time around that there will be you know. Uh, receiving more votes and hopefully getting into the parliament as well. So all the best for that, Lily. Thank you very much. Um, moving along, uh, it's great to see so many of you joining in from different countries. Um, uh, one, oh, you know, big warm welcome uh, to, the, to the event. Um, there's another question from Chris, and this is uh, to um, Susan, if you can please uh, turn your camera on and come on to the Zoom. Uh, uh, site. Yes, so um, Chris was asking what is the best way to get in touch or best way uh, to get to communication out to the women in the rural and remote areas in Fiji? Is it by radio? Thank you, uh, Nalini, and thank you, Chris, for that question. Um, yes, well, radio is definitely a, a very powerful medium. We, we also realize that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, even rural women that are on social media and so on. Uh, because of connectivity and so forth. Uh, Facebook is quite uh, popular for the older age groups. There's also, uh, for, for what we do as a feminist media organization, for, to, to reach out to our rural women's networks when, you know, when, there's a, uh, when there's a depression that's coming. So that's our women's weather watch modality in place. We send out SMS blasts. So that would go to at least 500 women. So it really depends on the type of information that you're giving at that particular time, whether it's those snappy, concise, early warning messages that you need to disseminate or where there's, you know, uh, the conversation that you need to have in a convening. And that's where we basically convene those safe spaces uh, for diverse rural women. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, a big shout out to all the uh, uh, women's committee members from FDUC, Fiji Trade Unions uh, Union Congress, um, that is uh, that have joined. Um, and so it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Um, there's moving on. Um, I think um, the contributions from Offa Kesami from SPREP. 
um, has been uh, you know, very interesting, um, mainly in relation to uh, the contributions that uh, Samoa has made in its uh, second national, uh, I think at the NDC, these uh, are the national determined uh, contributions or commitments rather. Um, so I think um, that is important to note that yes, of course, uh, there's a lot of commitments being made, um, you know, but I think one of the important issues that we are trying to highlight here in this panel is that, you know, are, are women part of that? Uh, where are our voices, where's our lived realities and can things be done a little bit better in terms of having our, um, concerns um, noted as well in, because we've been saying it over and over again and the IP, IPPC and other you know international regional and even our national level we all know that women are disproportionately impacted by um, climate change and the impacts it, it has and you know we, we need to be looking at um, the slow onset, the rapid onset um, of, of the, the various types of impacts. And what does that mean in terms of the loss and damage that we are experiencing, the economic and non-economic? And, um, you know, so where are women's concerns in there when um, there's a plethora of policies um, and legislation and, and programs being implemented with, uh, you know, huge amounts of um, climate financing that is being coming our way, which we still say is not enough, but how do we know that whatever is coming our way is going to where it's needed the most? So um, this is what the panelists um, have been trying to, um, you know, highlight as well as, um, you know, um, bring to the forelight. And it's not just in these panels that we talk about these issues, we talk about these issues in many of our national fronts. And, uh, you know, we, do our best, but um, such is the context in the Pacific and many other countries around the world where you know our voices are not necessarily heard in that way. So moving into the other comments, um, let me see. Uh, uh, Yasmin, there's a question for you. Um, if you can just turn your camera on and, and come onto the Zoom. This is from Christine King. Um, I think, yes, someone who has a, a very keen interest in the work we do here in the Pacific. Um, she's uh, uh, inspired by your passion and she's asking, um, you know, how many, in the wider, how many in the wider Pacific support your work? I guess this is the work that um, Sister has been doing um, in the last few years. Uh, thank you, Christine, um, and really appreciate your response. I got a bit thrown off in the beginning. I've got my daughter in the background, so I was hoping that everyone captured what I was trying to say there. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I think, and honestly, to support um, the work that Sister is doing, um, we actually really would like um, for people to stand with us as we are going to be questioning the government um, uh, as they set up this new Ministry of Oceans and be posing the questions that I know that people who are working in the government are afraid to ask. Um, and, you know, we see that as our duty as civil society and as a citizen of this country, why are we setting up a Ministry of Oceans at the expense of a Ministry of Justice? And it would be wonderful if we could have that solidarity from people in the Pacific to be able to ask this question, um, because I do know that those public servants in government have told me that they are afraid to ask in fear of losing their jobs um, and being silent. So that would just be wonderful once we get into that process and that, that would be great if you could share our, our, our work. Thank you. Thanks, um, Yasmin. Um, and looking back into the chat box, I see that uh, Selena is asking for if there are any volunteer opportunities to help in any way. She lives in Australia. So many of our organizations, Selena, do have uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, you'd have to tap into um, our websites to see what uh, processes are involved and, um, you know, just be in touch um, with, the, with the different partners that we have and, um, uh, you know, and then take it from there. But given that we have a situation of uh, the COVID pandemic, many countries are restricting uh, travel and uh, movement. So, you know, that just depends on how each country's, um, you know, situation is changing in regards to the pandemic. 
Um, Chris, you're asking about uh, this recording be available. I think, uh, yes, of course, the um, session is being recorded. And um, there's, uh, I think it's uh, being, uh, will be put onto our social media pages. Def definitely on the FWRM um, page. Uh, so you can see it there and maybe the other partners will have it as well. So you can um, take the link from um, our social media pages. Um, there's a question from the question and answer uh, box. Um, and um, this could be to any of the panelists. Um, it is around are the newer NGOs of women. Yeah, uh, so maybe Doris and um, Yasmin, this is for you. As the newer NGOs of women seen as non-traditional, are the post-Christian revivals of women's traditional organizations that negotiate as a group with the men? Uh, if so, how are they economically supported? So um, either Yasmin or Doris, maybe Doris, you, you have the first go, please. And then yeah, followed by Yasmin. Um, <laughs> because I, um, I grew up in both places. I grew up in America and Samoa. So I can say it's non-traditional, but uh, it is very traditional as we are still, um, to get into the villages, it's still very traditional. So it's for me to learn. Um, the protocols of our country and how to implement, um, you know, the way of thinking is, for example, climate change, when we go into villages and we talk about the, the glaciers that are melting 5 billion miles away that's affecting us, how do we speak um, to traditional people, elderly people in a way where it's at the forefront of our oceans. So um, we are we can say we're non-traditional, traditional as we are a youth group, but I, I like to think that for myself, we had to understand how to be intergenerational and not feel like we're doing a big change because it's huge in our community and it's very scary. Yes. It is very scary. It's even scary for us, um, you know, the more established organizations as well, because the challenges are very complex. Yasmin, you would like to share? Um, I, I think that for us, I know that we identify as a feminist organization and that word um, feminism is not very welcome here. It's definitely got negative connotations to it, but because at the core of our work, we use arts, media and communications. Um, this has been a really powerful um, entry point to be able to progress gender equality while at the same time celebrating our culture and our traditions. Um, and, you know, I think by using arts, um, media, comms, we're able to create this dialogue. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a safe, creative space to be able to open up these conversations so that we can find new ways. So yes, we may be progressive, um, but at the same time, I know that because we really truly value celebrating Vanuatu and our culture, at the same time, I really believe that we can do both, progress gender equality while um, retain traditional values. It takes dialogue. We need to start to speak to each other about how we can hold tight to this while moving forward. Absolutely. No, I agree with you 100%. Um, Salote is asking if they can get a copy of the transcript. I'm sure if you email my colleagues, um, they will put their email in the chat box for you. Um, they can definitely facilitate uh, getting a copy uh, to you. Um, and we have one more question and I post this to Susan. Uh, Susan, you can put your camera on. Um, this question is around uh, how can policies and legislation become more inclusive of women here in Fiji? Thank you, Nalini. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's really the biggest question that we constantly ask uh, ourselves and constantly also uh, you know, uh, push the barriers and, uh, and and also talk to the state about, uh, you know, how can you include us a bit more and so forth. Um, it's, uh, and, and I've always, and, and, and I think it also has to do a lot with families uh, convenings that are based, you know, like it's, it's, it's a grassroots 
uh, movement building sort of work. Uh, and we know that, you know, to uh, that, that that we believe that, you know, doing everything in the communities and just being local, that is very impactful and so forth. Um, and to get, uh, you know, in those views in a very effective, imp impactful manner that you would have to get that at the local level. And then you start moving that up. If you're able to do that in a very multi-pronged way and where you're engaging with, uh, with the state and where the state is also engaging you in a very genuine, a uh, way where it's not tokenistic because you know sometimes it's it's quite nice to just say okay I'll, I have how many women at the table uh, but whether they you know whatever they say uh, does have um, an impact on the actual decision is another matter uh, so you know so so, so that's uh, so what we're just trying to do is really just to engage at various entry points uh, we're also you know hoping that events like this that's being uh, commemorated and celebrated in bar where you have two cabinet ministers that are there, that are there with their permanent secretaries, and that we have rural women in the same room, uh, that that engagement, you know, will really lead to something that's more impactful uh, post, uh, post uh, World Map Day, and that is not forgotten. Um, so, uh, and I guess also, it's also all the, you know, um, the, all the feminist work that we're trying to do as a We Rise Coalition and so on. Um, you know, Family Pacific cannot do this on their own or, or on our own. We have to work with feminist allies like all of you uh, to be able to, you know, to also just to get the state to, you know, to acknowledge us a bit more. Thank you, Susan. And I think this is an opportune moment um, for us to also uh, perhaps announce to the groups um, here who are from the Pacific, the many different countries in the Pacific, that uh, the We Rise Coalition will be organizing the third Pacific Feminist Forum this year as well. And those of us who have been part of the first and the second Pacific Feminist Forum will know um, the importance of solidarity and movement building for us, because um, you know, we are dealing with really complex issues complex issues would include, uh, you know, how we are impacted by the climate crisis. And the third um, Pacific Feminist Forum will be a bit different given the um, way in which the COVID uh, pandemic is impacting uh, our ability to gather and travel. So, um, you know, we are going to be organizing um, national uh, feminist forums in uh, up to about 16 countries across the region and uh, then com coming together in a regional virtual forum. So this is, will be an opportunity for many of you in uh, these 16 countries, which will, you know, is, is uh, going to be announced soon, um, you know, that uh, you can be a part of and carry on this conversation because we need to be forming our own tables as well as claiming the tables that are there for consultation and decision making. So it starts with us and it leads on to those are the tables because our voices cannot remain with us all the time. It needs to move. How do we do that? We do it by coming together, having consensus of issues and moving that forward. So, um, you know, with that, I, you know, we still have a few, a fair few minutes. So, you know, looking at how the Pacific is, is doing in, in terms of our concerns. You know, I don't have to be speaking too much about this, but we all know that the gender indicators, um, you know, for the Pacific, we're not doing uh, too well. You know, if we are looking at women in leadership, um, you know, we, we as a Pacific, as a region, are the lowest in terms of the IPU ranking. You know, there's a really, a really big, um, you know, uh, sort of gap in terms of where women are when we're looking at women in our parliaments. Um, and there's a lot that needs to be done. Yes, it, it takes a lot of effort and we are continuously talking about this issue, but that's the reality. If women are not in those type of leadership positions, where do we go to? Where do we... Um, push on our issues, because what we see is that uh, increasingly our governments are taking a very gender neutral approach, which, and you know, we all know that is not um, gender responsive at all. So what can be done then to ensure that what we are experiencing, what we have talked about, um, how does this present 
itself into uh, our, our policies and programs and legislation. And you know, one of the last things uh, that you know we talked about was on the data. Where is the evidence and where is the data? And often we see that data is gathered. There's a lot of data that is being gathered by many agencies, but it's not disaggregated. Um, so you know, at the bottom uh, line, we hope to have data that is sex disaggregated, so that it actually uh, contributes to policies, programs, and legislation that is being discussed and put into place is at least at some level gender responsive. So um, uh, maybe to explain from, from Fiji, and if I take on um, you know, uh, sort of an extension to my uh, moderator's um, hat and just explain two initiatives. Uh, that are you know is, is being implemented in the in Fiji. One is looking at a gender indicator that is very very um, important to us is around violence against women and girls, and we know that Fiji has one of the highest rates of violence. Um, uh, and um, in relation to that, because um, we have been doing a lot of work in terms of protection, but you know, moving into a prevention plan. So we've taken a very bold approach to a all of country, um, all of um, a population of uh, government and population approach to developing a national action plan, which looks at prevention of violence against women and uh, children, girls in particular, and uh, working out an action plan that is in consultation with as widespread as, as possible so that we are putting in realistic plans, realistically well-resourced, budgeted and well-resourced plan. So we are looking at, um, you know, uh, that this plan will indeed be cognizant of the fact of the kinds of violence that we see that women and girls are facing with the onslaught of the climate crisis, the disasters we experience, because um, it's important that this action plan addresses those issues. Um, the second initiative is to move our governments from being gender neutral to being gender responsive. We have a very all interesting all of government initiative, which is called the um, Gender Transformative Institutional Capacity Development, which is um, you know, actually getting all government ministries and agencies um, moving towards, first of all, um, starting with gender responsive programming and budgeting, very important. And then looking at moving um, into gender mainstreaming um, into all areas across um, uh, the ministries. So these are two initiatives um, that has been approved by our government, um, which could look at, um, you know, some of the issues that we are facing, but, um, you know, and uh, to see how our women included in that. So women have been part of the design of both the initiatives. Both the initiatives are led by our national women's machinery and um, the consultations uh, for at least the NAP for prevention of violence against uh, you know women and girls, that has included um, majority of women, um, you know, as well as men, in terms of designing that action plan. So um, I thought to just give you a little bit of uh, context around that, and we have another question, um, and this I think um, you know could be to any of the panelists, uh, and the question is are uh, these policies to practical realities for women also understood or made aware to men in the communities you interviewed or helped out. So maybe let me begin with Susan and then move down the panelist line. And I think this is a very interesting question um, for everyone to engage with. So Susan. Thank you, Nalini. Um... Yeah, just on that question, um, 
you know, the uh, spaces that feminine convenes, you know, that's a space for, for, for the diverse rural women. So whatever policy that government has and so on, we try and, you know, break that down, have that conversation in those particular spaces with the women and so forth. Because generally, it's a man that tend to have, you know, first hand, uh, first hand access to that particular information. But what uh, what has emerged a lot in our uh, convenings is that uh, because some of these women have been part of the network for for quite a while, they basically become, uh, you know, whether someone just said yesterday, and this was in Tavua, another Western town, that they become almost like the district officer in their particular community, where they, because we're, you know, sharing that information having that engagement in that space they take it back to their families that could be their spouses you know uh the, the members of the matangali the whole village and so on and then they also engage also with say the turangini koro and also share that information with him and so forth uh, so that you know so that sharing that engagement and so and so on happens it, and that's because you know, we try and do that movement building as a feminist uh, media organization with a diverse rural women's network. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Sharon, Susan. Um, uh, one of the other panelists would like to um, interact with that question uh, as well. Are the men engaged? Um, in these processes, um, either um, maybe Lily, are you still here, Lily? Yes. I think when disaster hits, uh, I think uh, everybody's seeking information and uh, they, they, they all try to um seek information and seek any help uh, uh, they could get uh, we had a major everybody ran to the church they were seeking refuge in the church you know at other time they don't go to the church but during this time everybody went to the church and uh, so these are some of the you know life lived experiences that we have but when it comes to disaster also, we see that there's uh, certain things pop up as well too, like there's there's uh, they they they've never and also there's negative things as well too, like maybe when disaster happens, there's uh, like when we hear this drought, like you know, like women were the only one that she was put put at the table, but then when they found that there were not many and there were no food there, then they they also tried out to try their best to help the woman to look for food. So this was something good and also try to get a family involved, more talking and see how they can, uh, they can. Um, that, that means that something good came out of, sometimes there's, you know, like impact happens, you know, and then, you know, and then also like, we also saw when this drought came in, like uh, when women were arrested, that there was this like push one of the women to the front to lead and talk and bring this, um, this um, issue out into the open, uh, where in some of our cultures, like you know, it's very diverse, and there's certain uh, forms that women are not allowed to stand and talk. But this last thing happened, and they saw the reality of it. So this also helped the woman go to go into be able to use the platform, which is a bit positive to give her, to give out the voice of the of the women as well. And then that that has been allowed, and then it can take on as well. So uh, that means that in some of these norms and traditional customs and tradition customs that we see, we have that can that has been uh, broken in that area as well but but when it comes to the no like, like we have their own specific role to play like the woman used to fetch water or do the gardening and all this there sometimes men they men they don't help but i see that when this disaster or anything happens then we see that men are coming forward and they also need information they also this this time they're really looking for information they don't know what is really happening uh they they have a lot of different beliefs as well uh they use ki different kinds of beliefs and it relates to traditional it relates to religion and things like that and they
they are confused about all these times. They that, that that moment of disaster. They they need to be like, especially with the women. They need to be comforted. They need to be counselled. They need a safe place to stay. And that is improving the the. Men. Thank you, Lily. And yes, you know, uh, I'm sure the men were really surprised uh, in, in terms of listening to the women's issues uh, because um, they don't see the impact they have on women in terms of their action because I'm sure the majority, if not 100% of the harassers were men themselves. So um, good on you for doing that. There's another um, question and I, maybe I pose this to Doris. Um, and it's around, uh, do you think women from NGOs or respective movements should join the political arena and address these issues with the authority or maybe create space for more female oriented workspace? Doris. I'm sorry, Nalini, can you um, say the question one more time? Yes, the question is, do you think women from NGOs or respective movements should join the political arena and address these issues with the authority or maybe create space for more female-oriented workspace? Yes, I think, um, speaking for myself, I, I want to take that next step <laughs> as a youth advocate. What my next step is, we need more people in, we need more women in parliament. We need more women in these spaces, especially the political arena, as much as we hate it, <laughs> as much as we, can talk about the corruption, but what are we going to do about it? What is the solution? And that's having one of us that actually have done the work go in the spaces and not just make a space for someone to come in and learn a little bit about organization. It has to be us. It has to be the, the, the people that are in this group, our coalition, the leaders, to make that, that leap because we know what's going on. We know it from the community level and we know how to speak on it. We got to make sure that we're informed, we're educated, and how to re-educate you know, our community on understanding, and again, like the question before, um, scared of change, when it's not change, it's just educating more. So yes. Great, thanks Doris. That's why I gave the question to you because I, I know your stance on you know what, what you'd like to do in future. Good, um, Yasmin, do you have an opinion on that? And also in the previous question, which looked at, um, you know, if, if, um, you know, are, are men aware, are men aware of you know, women's issues and, um, you know, have, have they been helping out or, you know, creating more obstacles, I would assume, but I leave you to respond to that from your context. Um, thank you, Nalini. Um, I think, you know, just building off what Doris is saying, you know, when we talk about women's issues, especially when we look at gender-based violence, it is not a woman's issue. It is a man's issue. It is not our problem. Men are the perpetrators of violence. And I think that's part of the narrative as well that we need to start going towards. You know, year after year, we talk about violence against women and girls. How do we stop it? And us women are coming together. We are now in a time after COVID with the climate crisis. Men, it is your turn now to come together. And this is your issue. You guys are the one perpetrating violence. You guys are the one, I'm sorry, stripping our earth of its resources. It is time for you to recognize and flip the script um, and take responsibility because us women are coming together. Look at us here now through the We Rise Coalition and playing our part. The men need to start doing their part and particularly with gender-based violence, this is not a woman's issue, this is a man's issue. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with that too and so are many of our participants. Um, I, I find this, this uh, comment um, in our chat box by Andy Ulamila very interesting. And uh, it's, it's a pet peeve for me as well. And this has been for a long while that, uh, you know, and I just read off um, what Andy Ulamila has said that we gave far too many gender work plans prepared by international consultants collecting dust as they do not lead to tangible results for the people on the ground. We need more authentic voices heard here to lead our work on gender in the Pacific. So, um, Susan, what do you feel about this statement by Andy Ulubila? I mean, for me, I agree. One thing that we have seen is that um, we need 
um, you know, women, men, people, young people, you know, the diversity um, to, of, of, you know, men and women in, in country to be designing this, to these work plans and programs uh, together, because we understand our realities the best we know what works for us we know what resources we need but you know we're never asked because it's so much better if some other um you know internationally renowned person is is brought in you know paid a lot of money to do this so but susan yeah, what is your perspective? Yeah, around? well, you know, absolutely, Nalini, and 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 you know, and we were talking, um, and and you you're talking about sustainability. I mean, the um the, the our political masters, well, the ministers were, were were also talking about them, but 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 just regardless, um, you know, when we did that uh, gender assessment up in the northern division late last year, uh, where Fiji's borders were basically still closed and so on. Um, and we started that from about August, from about September, October, and so on. And it did not even include us, you know, here in headquarters in the capital in Suva. This was our young feminist media team that was doing that gender assessment with partners that were on the ground. Some of them were also new that included, you know, the early childhood teachers and so on because the schools were on lockdown. And what we've and I presented the preliminary findings of that to the Fiji facility, which was, you know, our, our development partner for that particular project. And some of the preliminary findings are basically things that were not, that, that didn't really come out uh, in, in, in earlier reports, because we were convening uh, the spaces that that were safe, that the women knew that they owned, and they were talking to those that were familiar with their context and so on. And, you know, so it's just a matter of us, you know, uh, you know, here we are, um, as a as a we rise co coalition pacific feminists trying to also help each other and so on um, you know so that we can ensure that you know the voices that we share are also shared with a very do no harm uh, manner i mean there's a lot that also you know a lot of those that also come in that are so extractive extract the information take it and goodness knows wherever they're going to use it for or maybe sell it for for, for for the big bucks and we've all been talking about that nalini you know as um, you know as pacific feminists and so on and i'm sure that's something that will also come out in the in the upcoming pacific feminist forum absolutely true um i think um uh, looking at the question posed by uh, Jacinta Murphy uh, was talking, uh, asking, you know, are men even talking about being the problem? Um, well, in most of the countries, perhaps not, but in Fiji, with uh, the processes uh, in, in developing our national action plan for the, um, you know, prevention of violence against women and girls, it is based on one common root cause. You know, and it and it is pegged on that. You know, with patriarchy, the fact that we have entrenched gender inequality, um, uh, that you know that is the root cause. It is the power of one prominent gender over another. You know, um, and why does that happen? It is because of that inherent. Um, you know, um, entrenched nature of gender inequality. So for us, yes, um, that has led to men talk about being the problem. And it is in the consultations that we are engaging men you know, in many fields. The, you know, we're talking about formal justice sector with police. We're talking about, you know, um, men in sports and in you know, many different sectors and they too are, are coming up with um, some action points as to how um, they could be part of the um, prevention plan um, because we know that often that when we lift programs from other countries and just bring that over you know because of our cultural context um, it, it does not um, work out the same way. We do not get to those kind of results. And there are many um, programs that we can talk about which has um, uh, not worked. So we hope that this will definitely contribute to a significant reduction in uh, you know, the uh, prevalence rates um, that we have here in Fiji. Um, okay, I think, uh, well, we are coming to an 
uh, an end uh, to this session. And, um, you know, I, on behalf of um, the coalition, um, you know, partners, you know, I would sincerely uh, like to thank um, all of the, well, first of all, um, the partners themselves for coming on board as panelists, um, as well as, um, you know, all of you who have joined us from so many different, um, you know, parts of the world. It's incredible, um, you know, what we uh, get to, um, you know, uh, see and, and see how we can, you know, be together. This is the second year where, where we are having these side events um, on, on an online virtual platform, but it's great to have everybody uh, on. And so we thank you too for being here with us and sharing your thoughts and uh, contributing to our discussions. And we are um, definitely looking to see uh, how, you know, at least for those of us in the Pacific, um, you know, as part of the feminist movement, see how you can join this conversation and even more as part of the third PFF. And uh, we thank you, um, you know, Vinaka um, and our sincerest thank yous to all of you for joining this panel event. And thank you for making it a very meaningful one for us, the We Rise, the Coalition Partners as well. So um, those of you who would like to um, see, uh, uh, you know, the video or would like to um, have access to the transcript, you know, my colleague again is going to put her email in the chat box and uh, please do, uh, you know, give us, um, a shout out um, when you need uh, that information, as well as connect with us on our social media. Uh, my colleague is going to put us put up the handles um, for you as well. We'd love to hear you in those spaces. Um, and so, from all of us, um, you know, thank you very much. And uh, you know, everyone, please enjoy the rest of the day and rest of the week and rest of the CSW sessions. Um, I hope it works out in favor of um, you know, what we want uh, from our governments in terms of commitments, and then it becomes our responsibility to hold them to account. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Naka, thank you. Thank you, Nalini. <laughs> thank you, Nalini. <laughs>